chapter 3, um, the book of Acts closes with Paul uh, imprisoned in Rome. Now, Paul probably arrived there around 59 AD. Um, this time of Paul's imprisonment, this time, Paul's captors were very lenient towards him. Um, in fact, Acts 28 says about his time there, it says, Then Paul dwelt two years, two whole years, in his own rented house. So he was under house arrest, basically, and he received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And it was during this time that he wrote what we know as the prison epistles because he wrote them while held or imprisoned in, in Rome. So those epistles were Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. Now, Paul eventually gained his opportunity to appeal to the emperor, and he won his release. His release was around A.D. 60 or 61, something like that, and it was thought that Paul then went as far west as Spain. Now, we know that a visit to Spain was in Paul's plans because of Romans 15. There he wrote, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. Now, as much as Paul wanted to preach the gospel, he wanted the gospel to be heard. The expanding Roman Empire made it possible for him to expand his ministry further west. But something that also made it possible for him to expand his ministry were the many churches that he planted and the leaders that he was raising up within those churches. They also played a part in, in expanding the gospel, sending the gospel out, raising people up and sending them out into the world to share the gospel. Now, the Bible doesn't say for sure whether Paul made it to Spain or not, but the majority of scholars believe that he did, in fact, make it there. In fact, church historians from the early fathers to much later maintain that Paul actually went as far as Britain preaching the gospel. Now, his journey to Spain and beyond, it, this may have taken two years, probably 63 to 64 A.D. On his return, Paul visited many of those churches that he founded, and he wrote these letters to Timothy and Titus that we call the pastoral epistles. Then came a series of events that unleashed opposition to Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. There was this suspicious fire that broke out in Rome, clearing enough land for Emperor Nero to begin construction of his new, huge new palace. And though the fire was probably orchestrated by Nero, Nero himself, Christians were blamed and heavy persecution by Rome against Christians began. At the same time, events were playing out in Israel, leading Rome to tighten their already iron grip on, on Israel. So the Jewish believers in Israel were beginning to leave. They were sensing that something bad was about to happen. And those believers were making their way to the places where Paul had ministered. And the churches in those places needed to be prepared for this influx of Jewish believers. This meant taking the time to address and solidify church structure, uh, gender roles and, and leadership, expectations of behavior in the church, and contending for the faith. And the churches, even though the church was young, already there were those who were twisting the doctrines of the Bible. Some were taking Paul's letters and twisting his words to mean things that he did not intend. Even the apostle Peter recognized this. He said, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. Now, in chapter 1, Paul took some time to encourage Timothy in his calling and to address some doctrinal concerns. Then in chapter 2, Paul addressed etiquette and gender roles in the churches. And today in chapter 3, Paul again addresses solidifying church structure, and he does that by addressing leadership. Now, first, Paul will discuss elders uh, who have the role of oversight, spiritual guidance, and, and sound teaching in the church. Serving in the role of an elder, Paul will say, is a good work. It requires the elder to have a mature Christian character. Now, Paul will also say that those who meet the physical needs of the church, or, or deacons, we know them as deacons, are also are to be worthy of respect. Now, deacons take care of all the physical needs of the church, and they must also demonstrate maturity in the faith. Now, Paul has just written in chapter 2, that women were not to hold positions of authority over men in the church, but he did not want to leave the impression 
that just any man is qualified. No man is qualified to be a spiritual leader in the church just because of his gender. What Paul presents here in regards to qualifications and virtues is not unique to this letter, and it's actually not even unique necessarily to the Bible. There are lists of qualifications and appropriate uh, virtues for various leadership positions that appear in both Jewish and Gentile sources outside of the Bible. The list commonly applied to uh, political roles or military offices, but also to religious ones. Certain officials in the Greek world, in both cities and, and associations, were naturally called overseers. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls also used the Hebrew equivalent of the term for an office of leadership at Qumran. And these qualifications are equivalent to uh, the synagogue leaders that were responsible for synagogue service. Now, today we might see something similar to what we're going to see here in 1 Timothy 3 if we're job searching. Um, you know, usually we'll, we'll find a list of, of qualifications and expectations. And it's just common sense that positions, whether worldly or spiritual, are better served by those who have the proper credentials. In the church of Jesus Christ, the greatest credential is what we would call being saved and identification with Christ, which means we have left the old sinful life and fully embraced new life in Christ. All other qualifications depend on that one great qualification. Without that one, there is no way that any man can perform the duties of an elder or a deacon in the church. Now, also in our chapter, Paul explains that the church promotes godliness, that is, the truths of salvation and righteousness in Christ, which produce holiness in believers. The church of God is a very special fellowship, the very household of the Lord. In recognition of that, people should conduct themselves in the church correctly, reverently, respectfully. All right, so let's, let's pray and then we'll, we'll get right into the word here. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning that you would open up your word to us so that we might understand it and perform it. Lord, we know that you are returning soon, and we desire to live in such a way that we are found pleasing to you when you do. Speak to us today, not in man's word of wisdom, but in your word and your wisdom. We pray this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so starting with verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle and quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up and pri with pride, he fall into the same condemna condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Bishop here is the Greek word episkopos, which means overseer. Now, depending on the translation that you're using, you might see the word elder, overseer, shepherd, or, or perhaps even guardian. All of these correspond closely to our term pastor. Now, Jesus is called the shepherd and overseer of your souls in 1 Peter 2. The elders had the responsibility of overseeing the work of the church. In Acts 20, Paul called the elders of the Ephesian church to himself and said to them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Elder is the translation of the Greek word presbytes, which means an old man. Now, Paul used the word presbyterion um, in 1 Timothy 4.14, referring not to a denomination, but to elders in the Ephesian church. So elders, bishops, overseers, they were to be mature people with spiritual wisdom and experience. 
Now, in regards to being teachers of the flock, they were to feed the flock, following in the shoes of Paul, who said, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. The first thing here that Paul says is that a man who desires a position of, bi of bishop desires a good work. I think he says that because after reading the list of qualifications, you'd have to be kind of crazy to want the job. So he wants to start out on an encouraging note. But the idea is that this is a good, this is a noble, this is an honorable work, and, and it requires good, noble, honorable men to do it. It's not, here's a good job to go after, it's stable with a good, steady income. In fact, if you're teaching the Bible as it is written and not tickling ears, you aren't going to be getting rich. And your job will, will likely be in danger because people want someone who will tickle their ears. Now, there's a parallel passage in Titus 1 that covers uh, a similar list of qualifications with elders in mind. Church organization it was actually rather simple in the apostolic days. There were pastors, um, we would think of them as elders or bishops, and, and there were deacons. Now you might remember that in Philippians, Paul greeted the bishops and deacons of the church in Philippi. It seems that there was not just one, but there were several elders overseeing the work of each church. Some were involved in, in ruling, that is, organization and discipline, while others were involved strictly in teaching. Now, that was good because it, it's incredibly hard to have one man doing both and, and doing both well. But these men had to be qualified. Very often, what, what man looks at as qualifications don't match up with what God actually says. Um, going, going to seminary does not make you qualified. Being a good talker doesn't make you qualified for spiritual leadership. Natural or spiritual gifts in themselves don't qualify you for spiritual leadership. What one gives to the church or, or how much one volunteers does not qualify one for spiritual leadership. What qualifies a man for spiritual leadership is godly character. It was good for a growing believer to aspire to the office of uh, elder or, or bishop but the best way to, to achieve that was to develop Christian character. A person's character is the sum of his or her disposition, her thoughts, uh, his intentions, his desires, his actions. And it's good to remember that character is gauged by general tendencies, not on the basis of a few isolated actions. So when we talk about the list of qualifications, understand that nobody's perfect. And there may be times when an elder misspeaks about something or makes a really bad judgment call. But, you know, does that mean that, that he's now disqualified because he's not blameless? Well, no, because a few misspoken words or a bad decision does not negate a pattern of blamelessness over a number of years. A good example of this is Abraham. He's thought of as a great man of faith. However, when you, when you look at his life, you see several times when he wavered in his faith. David's the same way. But Scripture characterizes these men as having great faith. Because faith was the tone of their lives, despite times when their faith wavered. You know, in fact, the Bible even characterizes Lot as righteous. Now, that's not to you know, excuse bad choices or, 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 or bad actions. It's, it's just that we, we can read through these things and we can come to improper conclusions because we've got the wrong idea. Or, or it could cause us to say, I myself, I could never be, be an elder because I'm not perfect. In the church, becoming an elder is a very serious decision. It's not one that, that anyone should really take lightly. Paul gave 16 qualifications here for a man to meet if he is expected to serve in this function. Blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine. That's W-I-N-E. 
sometimes we have to whine a little, right? <laughs> not violent, not greedy for money, gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, a godly family, not a novice, a good testimony outside of the church. So let's, let's take a look at each of these individually and, and see what we find here. Blameless was that first one. This word literally means nothing to take hold upon. That is, he should strive to have nothing in his life that Satan or the unsaved can take hold of in order to criticize uh, or open up the church to attack. No one can stand up and rightfully accuse him of a, a horrible pattern of sin. Now, no man living is sinless, but we must strive to be blameless or above reproach. In fact, in verse 10, when speaking about deacons, Paul used the phrase being found blameless. This implies being blameless uh, is demonstrated with a track record of behavior. This doesn't mean that nobody will accuse this person. Joseph, Joseph was blameless and yet accused and jailed by Potiphar. Daniel was accused. Jesus and his disciples were also accused. Now, the next qualification is this, the husband of one wife. An elder's home life is very important, and especially his marital status. Now, we'll see that... This same requirement applies to deacons later in verse 12. The elder is to be a one-woman man, so to speak. The idea is that his love and affection and heart is given to one woman, and that being his lawful wedded wife. Now, polygamy wasn't practiced in the Roman world outside of Israel, though illegal, uh, illegal bigamy and certainly adultery were practiced um, as well as having concubines. Now, given the context here, husband of one wife no doubt means uh, a faithful husband. And so it, it kind of presupposes marriage, but it doesn't necessarily. We could, we could read in the text that, that the elder has to be married, yet that's not necessarily what, what Paul is saying here. And we'll get to that a little bit more when we look at the qualifications for deacons. Now, the next one here is sober or sober-minded. This doesn't have anything to do with being drunk or not. The Greek word sophron means prudent and self-controlled. This does not mean that the overseer has you know, no sense of humor or that he's always solemn uh, and, and you know, has a, a frown on his face. Rather, it suggests that he knows the value of things and he doesn't cheapen the ministry or the gospel with a bunch of foolishness. Paul also says that the bishop must be of good behavior. Now, that's the same Greek word that is translated modest in 1 Timothy 2.9, referring to women's clothing. Appropriate is another term that works here. His manner and behavior is appropriate for his calling. The overseer is also to be given to hospitality. Literally, the term means loving the stranger. This was an important ministry in the early church when, when traveling believers would need a place in which they could stay. But even today, it is important that a pastor and his wife are willing to receive others into their homes and minister to strangers. Paul says a pastor should be apt to teach. He should be skilled enough in the Bible to teach others not just the milk, but the meat of the word. As for what he should teach, Paul has been very, very clear on what he should teach. He should teach no other doctrine than that which has been given to us by God through his word, is what Paul uh, says uh, earlier in, in, no, actually, I think that, yeah, was that in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy? I'm quoting from a, an area I can't even remember where I'm quoting from. I think that was 1 Timothy. Um, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says, and the things that you have heard, heard from me among many witnesses, commit the, these to faithful men who will, able to, who will be able to teach others also. So teaching the word of God is one of the elders' main ministries. A pastor is automatically a teacher. 
Elders also should be involved in a teaching ministry and might be called upon to teach in the assembly. Uh, Philip, Philip, uh, Phillips Brooks, an uh, American pastor from the 1800s, he said about being apt to teach, it is not something to which one comes by accident or by any sudden burst of fiery zeal. So a pastor must be a student of the Word of God and, and all the things that can assist him in knowing and teaching that word. Now, regarding this position, Paul also says that the elders should be not given to wine. And the Greek word here, it means addicted to wine. The fact that Paul advised Timothy to use wine for medicinal purposes indicates that, that complete abstinence was not demanded of believers. However, the believer should be led by the Spirit and not by addictions. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You might remember that, that Paul criticized some of the members of the Corinthian church because they were getting uh, drunk at the love feast that, that came after the Lord's Supper. You know, it's, it's often supposed uh, that in, in Bible times, grape juice you know, would inevitably become fermented you know, if it was kept for any length of time. And then so, you know, we come to this conclusion that whenever the Bible mentions wine, it's referring to the alcoholic beverage, you know, commonly known as wine today. But, you know, ancient civilizations, they actually had ways of preventing fruit uh, and different fruit juices from fermenting. Um, the Jewish people, they, they would often dilute their wine with water to make sure that it wasn't real strong, or they would even boil it or even filter it to remove the gluten to prevent it from fermenting. So just drinking the grape juice or even the, the watered-down wine of those days would not make one an alcoholic or make one drunk. For that, for that one would need to, to be drinking the, you know, the special strong stuff. Now, in regards to an overseer, Paul's admonition and example in Romans 14, especially Romans 14.21, would apply today in a very special way. It says in Romans 14.21, It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So then a godly pastor and elder would certainly want to give the best example and do his best to never be an excuse for sin in the life of a weaker brother or sister. Now next Paul says that the elders should not be violent. The Greek word uh, plectes means violent, bully. You know, there are pastors who use bullying tactics on their congregation in order to, to get people to serve, to make financial offerings, or, or to do whatever he wants them to do. But the Bible says, it says here that the overseer is not to be one who uses manipulation, which is committing violence against one's own congregation. Next, the bishop should not be greedy for money. John Calvin wrote, The man who will not bear poverty patiently and willingly will inevitably become the victim of, me of mean and sordid covetousness. There are those who use the ministry with the aim of fleecing the sheep. Over the past few weeks, you know, when speaking of false doctrines being taught in our time, these are some of the people who do that. Covetous pastors who have you know, special deals going on on the outside of their churches. And, and those outside activities erode their character and, and hinder their ministry. And they probably manage to work giving into every sermon, every book, every television broadcast. And they are probably antagonistic and manipulative of their congregations. Now, in contrast, Peter wrote that pastors should not work for dishonest gain in 1 Peter 5. It's a long list. <laughs> Starting to rethink my job. <laughs> now, it, it is weird to stand up here and talk about one's own job qualifications. <laughs> kind of an awkward thing. And, you know, it's, it's like, like, here's a list of things that I really need to improve on. Next, elders are to be gentle. The pastor must listen to people 
and be able to take criticism without lashing out. He should be able to receive an email and let it sit for a while <laughs> before he responds. Instead of you know retyping it 20 times. <laughs> no, can't send that. That can't send that. You know, but he should also permit others to serve God in the church without being overbearing, without being manipulative or, you know, dictating to them. You know, as, as pastor, I'm not some kind of lord or anything like that. Um, there, there are things that, you know, we do on a Sunday morning um, that coming with my background, I would say, Makes no sense. We wouldn't do that. We can't do that. Um, having the kids come in here and and have their worship time with everyone and spending you know fifteen twenty minutes there at the front of, of service with the kids worshiping with us uh, you know that that's something that's not in my background that never you know the churches that I the church that I, I was assisting pastor at that never would have happened. But but we do that here, and that was somebody else's idea. And man, it's been a huge blessing. It's been great, and I wouldn't do it any other way now. I, I, in fact, I, I think all churches should do it that way. Having the kids in on the first Sunday of every month so that they can uh, sit with their parents and, and understand what sanctuary etiquette looks like and uh, how things work in the main sanctuary, as well as, as just hearing uh, the pastor actually teach. Um, not something that would normally happen in churches that, that I've been associated with. But, you know, here we do that, and that wasn't my idea. You know, so I don't have to have all the ideas. As, as pastor, I don't have to. Um, I'm okay with... If somebody stepping out in faith, you know, in, in, in doing something and then watching that to see if the Lord blesses it or not. If the Lord doesn't bless it, then okay, you know, we can step back and we can rethink it. But if the Lord's blessing it, then, you know, why not? Why not do it? You know, and do it with gusto. I mean, you guys are, you know, we, we have different ways of, of serving around here, and at very few times do I ever talk about uh, serving. But, you know, if somebody was to, to walk up and, and say, hey, I, I noticed the bathrooms need cleaning, um, you know, can I help? Yeah, that would, that's awesome. That would be fantastic. Um, I'm certainly not going to say no to that. <laughs> you know, if somebody says, hey, I've got a, a background running uh, – media stuff, doing soundboard and all, or, or even playing bass guitar. Now, I don't have to play bass guitar all the time. So, you know, I, 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 in no, by no means being pastor am I uh, an overlord or, or of any kind, and I don't desire to be. I want everyone to have the opportunity to use the gifts that God has given them. And sometimes, you know, you need that freedom to express that gift uh, without somebody saying, you're doing it wrong. Now, certainly there are times, you know, some things somebody might decide, you know, would be super spiritual if they did. They, it would be completely inappropriate if they did, you know, and those things have to be addressed and stopped pretty quick. But, you know, if you got a question about it, you can always ask me. I'd love you just run it by me, and I, I'd be glad to give you an answer on it. But, you know, I, I'm open to all kinds of ideas. Uh, I love the Lord speaks to you guys, the Lord speaks to me, um, and I, I love to hear from you guys about what the Lord is speaking to you. Um, the next qualification is not quarrelsome. You know, pastors should be peacemakers, not <laughs> troublemakers. Now, this doesn't mean that, that you know, that, that we have to compromise our convictions. But, you know, we can disagree on things without being disagreeable. Uh, one other pastor once told me that short tempers do not make for long ministries. And the next quality 
is not covetous. You can covet many things besides money. Uh, popularity. And this one hurts. A large ministry. Um, there's lots of things, different things that you can covet that are not money. But, you know, the Greek word here actually specifically means not loving money. Money moves a lot of people to do a lot of rotten things. And a pastor should be moved by God, not moved by money. Now we're, we're getting to the final three here. And this next one is a godly family. This does not necessarily mean that a pastor must be married or, or if married, that a pastor has to have children. It means that the person that he is at church is the person that he is at home. Not putting on a show at church and then being somebody completely different at home. Let me explain, and, and really this is true for all Christians, but those serving in authoritative roles should be examples to the rest of the flock. So for Christians, the church and the home are one. We should oversee both of them with love, with truth, and with discipline. The pastor cannot be one thing at home and be something else at church. If he is, then I'll tell you, his children are going to pick up on that. And there will be problems. And the same is true of all Christians. Now, of course, we all know that every child has the capacity to rebel, and many children from good homes do. But if rebellion is to happen, it should be in spite of the parents rather than because of the parents. Now, the word rule in verses, uh, what, 4 and 5, it's used twice. It means to preside over, to govern, and it suggests that a pastor is the one who directs in what goes on in the church. Now, according to 1 Peter 5, 3, that should not be in a lording over kind of way, but in, as a godly example instead. Paul says the overseer is also not to be a novice. Now, this is the Greek word uh, neophutos, neophutos. It means newly converted. The more modern word is neophyte. So Paul is speaking of a young Christian here. Age is no guarantee of maturity. But it is good for a man to give himself time for study and for growth before he serves in any leadership role in the church. You know, some... some People just mature faster than others. But many pastors have fallen very hard because they were not mature enough in the faith to serve in that capacity. They might have had lots of biblical knowledge, but very little maturity, which comes from testing and trials. You know, and Satan enjoys seeing an untested pastor succeed and get proud then Satan can tear down all that has been built up. All right, number 16 of the top 16 qualifications of bishop, elder, and overseer is a good testimony outside of the church. These characteristics should be evident to all, even unbelievers. The elder must be a good Christian, not just not only inside the church or around the congregation, but everywhere in the presence of everyone. You know, in Paul's day, there was the ever-present danger of false accusation from the Judaizers, uh, from the peddlers of false doctrines, from those just seeking to persecute the church. And it required leaders in Paul's day to do everything in their power to avoid scandal. A solid reputation was helpful for church leaders. But of course, things have changed today, right? And no longer do people make fun of the church. No longer do people point at pastors who have fallen or made terrible mistakes and, and mock Christianity because of it. Now, obviously, I'm kidding. It happens all the time. So very, very important that a pastor is the same inside the church as he is outside the church. 
If you wouldn't do something in the pulpit, don't do it out in the parking lot. Now, you know, no pastor, elder, or church leader ever feels that he is uh, all that he should be. And so the congregation needs to, to pray for their pastor constantly. Verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. The English word deacon is a transliteration of the Greek word diakonos, which simply means servant. The office of a deacon is similar to the office of the attendant in a synagogue. The synagogue attendant was responsible for the synagogue building and would normally have been the owner of the home in which a house synagogue would have met. Now, with regard to the Christian church, it is likely that the origin of deacons is recorded in Acts chapter 6, Now, I know you guys are familiar with that passage. The need in that passage was realized for men to serve the physical needs of the body while the apostles ministered to the spiritual needs of the body. Now, that's not to say that the work of the deacon is unspiritual or or even less than that of an elder or bishop. In fact, the first deacon, Stephen, later became the first martyr of the church. In churches today, deacons relieve the pastors and the elders of other tasks so that they can can focus more on the ministry of the word, on prayer, and and, and spiritual oversight. And it's a very important role. Even though deacons are not given the same authority of elders, they must still meet certain qualifications. Some overlap with the qualifications of the elders. One one might expect that, since most of the time an elder started out as a deacon, now, of course, that means that these qualifications also apply to the elders. The first qualification is the deacon must be reverent. And the Greek word means dignified and worthy of respect. A deacon should be worthy of respect, a man of Christian character that's worth imitating. He should take his responsibilities seriously and use the office, not just fill the office. The second qualification of the deacon is not double-tongued. Uh, the Greek word here is uh, thelogos. It means insincere. He does not say one thing to one member and something entirely opposite to another member. And you can depend on what he says. The next qualification is that he is not given to much wine. Now, like with the elders, the deacons should not be given over to, or should be given over to the Spirit of God, but not given over to alcohol. The deacon, like the pastor and elders, they hold an important office in the church. And, and are very visible to the congregation. And so the deacon would certainly want to give the best example so that he is not an excuse for sin in the life of a weaker believer. The deacon must not be greedy for money. Deacons may at times help with the offerings and lead benevolence ministries. It may be tempting to steal or to use funds in selfish ways. So very practically, a deacon should have a testimony of not being greedy for money. The deacon must be holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. In other words, doctrinally sound. Paul uses the Greek word mysterion to mean truth once hidden but now revealed by God. The doctrines of the faith are hidden to those outside of the faith, meaning they cannot be understood by them. You may have noticed this in the way that those outside of the church make light of many of the doctrines of the church, doctrine of the Trinity, Uh, regeneration, salvation by grace through faith, and so forth. But these things can be understood by those who trust in the Lord. So deacons must know, understand, and obey Christian doctrine with a good conscience. It's not enough to, to sit in meetings and make ministry decisions. They have to base their decisions on the Word of God, and they must back up their decisions with godly lives. A deacon who does not know the word of God is not going to be able to manage the affairs of the church. A deacon who does not live the word of God but has a defiled conscience is not going to be able to manage 
the church of God as well. Um, popular, being successful in business, being generous in giving, those things do not qualify anyone to serve as a deacon. The deacon should be tested and proved. You know, a man demonstrates his fitness for office in the church by his conduct, and this implies watching their lives and seeing how they conduct themselves. Someone who is new to the church who has, or who has been attending and, and wants to participate may be, begin by serving in something like hospitality or the sound booth or sparkle or, or greeting or other ways. And as they prove themselves faithful in those ministries, they may be considered then for, for leadership roles. And, you know, that's the principle that we see in Matthew 25, 21. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Well, there are quite a few leaders in the, in, in, in the Bible were first tested as servants. You know, Joseph was a servant in Egypt for 13 years before he became the second ruler of the land. And some of that time he spent in prison. Moses cared for sheep for 40 years before God called him. Joshua was Moses' servant before he became Moses' successor. And David was tending his father's sheep when Samuel anointed him king of Israel. So David also, you guys probably remember this, David also spent 10 to 15 years in exile before becoming king. Even our Lord Jesus came as a servant and labored as a carpenter, and the apostle Paul was a tent maker. First a servant, then a ruler. It's the biblical way of raising up leadership in the church. An untested Christian is an unprepared Christian. Now, there are a few more qualifications for deacons to go here. In verse 11, like he did with overseers, Paul now directs attention to the homes of deacons. So the next qualification is godly homes. The deacon's wife is a part of his ministry. Godliness must begin at home. If they're married, their wives must be Christians. She should be serious about the ministry, not given to slanderous talk or, or gossip, and faithful in all that she does. The wives of overseers should be the same way and examples to the wives of the deacons. Now, some Bible scholars believe that, that verse 11 refers not to the wives of deacons, but to another uh, order of ministers, the deaconesses. And that may be the case. The wording of the text in the original language will, will actually permit either possibility. Many churches do have deaconesses, and it is a biblical thing. Romans 16 informs us that, that Phoebe was a deaconess from the church in Centria. Now, perhaps in some of the churches, the wives of the deacons were actually considered deaconesses. Either way, you know, thank God for the, the, the ministry of godly women in the local church, whether they hold any office or not. You know, it's not necessary to hold an office to have a ministry or to exercise a gift. Now look at verse 13. There Paul closes out this section on leadership roles in the church with a requirement. The deacon, and I believe this holds to the higher offices as well, elder and pastor, are to use the office, not just fill the office. He's to be faithful in the office to which he's been called. A faithful deacon has a good standing before God and before men and can be used of God to build the church. It's a very serious matter to serve in church. You know, each of us must search our own hearts to be certain that we're qualified, not setting aside or discounting the grace of God, as well as the sanctifying work that he's doing in our lives. Now, verse 14. <clears throat> These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write to you that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among Gentiles, believed on in the world, uh, received up in glory. And this, from verse 16 on, uh, may have actually been a, a hymn in the early church. Which is interesting, because, and that is one deep hymn. That is a deep song, a lot deeper than many of the worship songs that we have today. 
So elders, deacons, and church members need to be reminded of what church is. In this brief paragraph here at the very end of, of this chapter, Paul gave three pictures of the church. First, in verse 15, Paul says the church is the house of God. Now, the Greek word for house here is oikos, which means house, home, or household. God's church is a family. It's a household. And I believe that uh, household here is the better translation. It's captured that way in the ESV, the NLT, the NASB, and the NIV. Now, when a sinner believes in Jesus Christ as Savior, he is born again into God's family. John wrote in his gospel, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Later in chapter 5, Paul advises Timothy to treat the members of the local church as he would treat the members of his own family. Now, because the local church is a family, it needs to be fed. And the only diet that nourishes the people is the word of God. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said that the word of God is our bread. In Hebrews 5, the Bible says that God's word is milk and meat. In Psalm 119, it speaks of the Word of God as honey. The Word of God is our bread, our milk and meat, and our honey. It's good food to be consumed, but it is our choice to consume it. You know, a pastor must take the time to nourish himself so that he is able to nourish others. Now, let me tell you, a church doesn't grow by addition. A church grows by nutrition. Now, when I talk about church growing, I'm not talking about growing in numbers. I'm talking about big Christians. I'm talking about maturity in the flock. Mature Christians. So let me tell you, there are a lot of really big churches where people go, and on a Sunday morning, they get handed a piece of lettuce and a Coke. And they like it because they get, they don't have to hear anything really convicting and they get something sweet. And that church may physically grow to thousands. but I guarantee you that most of that church are babies. And they're not maturing because they're not receiving the full nourishing word of God. They're stuck on the milk and they're never getting the meat. Now also like a, a family, a church needs discipline and love. You know, all children, again, have the potential to rebel. But children who are not disciplined are far more likely to do so. The spiritual leaders of the assembly should exercise discipline. Sometimes people may need a rebuke. Other times the discipline is something more severe. In any household, the children need encouragement and example. And as Paul has mentioned in his letter, as well as in 1 Thessalonians, godly example to the household of the church is very important. Now, the next picture that the, of the church that Paul gives is the church as an assembly. The word church is a translation of the Greek word ekklesia, which mean, means called out assembly. It's used about a hundred times in the New Testament to refer to local assemblies of called out believers. There are many different kinds of assemblies, but the church is the assembly of the living God. Because it is God's assembly, he has the right to tell us how it ought to be governed. And because, as Acts 20 reads, the church has been purchased with the, blood, with the blood of God's Son, we should conduct ourselves in ways that please God. Now, finally, the third picture of the church here is the pillar and ground of the truth. The word ground there, it suggests an earthen defensive wall. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us that the church is built on Jesus Christ, the truth. But here Paul also says that the church is itself a pillar 
and defense for the truth. It's a pillar in that the church's ministry relates primarily to displaying the truth of the word. Like, like a work of art might be placed on a, on a pillar or a pedestal so that everyone can see it. We should hold forth the truth, put it on display so that all can see God's word is true. Uh, the local church also puts Jesus Christ on display in the lives of uh, faithful members. As a defensive wall, the church protects the truth and makes sure it does not fall. Instead of the, the popular book of the day, instead of getting up and in, in, in teaching that, one should be able to go to church and expect that, hey, we're going to be in the next chapter of the Bible. Not the next chapter of the circle maker or whatever. It's interesting. You know how I ended up at, at Calvary Chapel? Well, one of the ways... I believe God led me to Calvary Chapel, but one of the ways was looking for a church. It was hard to find one that wasn't teaching, uh, uh, what was the name of the book? Uh, yes, Purpose Driven Life. And it was really hard. I, you know, you would go and, and drive by churches to, to check them out, and they'd have on their little billboard out there, next week, Purpose Driven Life. What? How about next week, the Bible? <laughs> and I found Calvary Chapel and verse by verse and chapter by chapter where the sheep come to eat so the church is a defensive wall against or should be a defensive wall against those things coming in false doctrines and different things that would seek to take from the word of God and when that doesn't happen, when, when churches allow uh, other doctrines to come in, it compromises their ministry. And the enemy makes progress. Now, sometimes church leaders must take a militant stand against sin and apostasy. This doesn't mean, uh, it, well, it doesn't make them popular. But you know, that does please the Lord. Now, look at verse 16, and we're going to close here. According to verse 16, the main truth to which a church should bear witness is the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's interesting. This was probably a, a hymn of the early church. Um, it says, Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, not only at his birth, but during his entire earthly ministry. And, and then we have justified as next, but a better translation of that is actually vindicated. Though his own people as a nation rejected him, Jesus Christ was vindicated in the Spirit. For the Spirit empowered him to do miracles and even to be raised from the dead. We could say that Jesus was justified by the Spirit in the sense that he was declared to be by the Holy Spirit what he always was, completely justified before the Father. Um, it also says scene of angels. That suggests that many times that the elect angels were associated with the life and ministry of our Lord. However, Jesus did not die for angels. He died for lost sinners, and so he was preached among the nations. Ethnos is the word there that's unfortunately translated Gentiles here in the NKJV, but it, it means nations. And this reminds us of, of the commissions the Lord gave to his church to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. At the ascension, he was received up in glory. See this in Acts 1. And Jesus is going to return one day to take his church to share in that, in that glory. Now, one interesting thing about this text is that I mean, the whole text of, of chapter 3 here, is that overseers, elders, and deacons are all normal, ordinary people. They're not super people. 
or special in some way, except that by grace they've been saved through faith. How encouraging it is to see the mission of the church being committed to ordinary people. People like you and me, reserved, perhaps kind of shy, sincere but maybe uncomfortable with uh, opposition. Sometimes just feel like we just can't cope. Just ordinary people like you and me permitted by God to serve him in so many ways in his church. And Christ's church has endured. And from generation to generation, his church has communicated the Lord's enduring gift to those who choose to make him their own. Let's pray. Lord, we we thank you for this time that we've had together worshiping you, studying your word. We thank you that you are faithful, that your mercy does endure forever. Lord, we ask that you would increase our love for one another and for all. Establish us in all things. Keep our minds and our hands from evil and, and protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. Thank you for the the leaders and the the teachers that you give to us. Thank you for being our strength and our shield. Lord, we, we place ourselves before you to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory and use us to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to the unsaved world. We thank you, Father, that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. We thank you that your word says that though all of us are sinners, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if you're here this morning and you have never received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you can receive him today. All you have to do is confess him as your Lord and your Savior. gospel is such a simple plan. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do the right work. You don't have to climb any steps or ladders. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you don't know Jesus, then I pray that this morning you would do that, that you would confess Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. If that's you and you've never done that then I'm here and I would love to pray with you after service or one of the uh, Todd or, or John or someone else we'd love to sit down with you and talk to you about the gospel give you a Bible if you don't have one and we can pray with you May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen.
So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful, great week. <clears throat> and uh, hope to see you next Sunday.